Hi, welcome to the 10th Surface Ventures webinar. Um, thanks for joining us. Before we start any further, before we go any further, sorry, come, can you please write where you're joining us from today in the chat box on the right hand side? Great, we have a few people from all across the globe. Brilliant, um, that seems to be working, which is great. So uh, to begin, my name is uh, Tahid Khan. I'm a, a vice president at Surface Venture and I'm your host for today. Um, we're a non-for-profit organization and our mission is to provide a world-class surface engineering education for academia and industry. So every month we aim to bring you a sector leading uh, speaker to present the current challenges and future trends in surface engineering. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Karsten Garchaud, who will, who will be talking about laser surface texturing, um, which is the challenges and opportunities in that area. To give a bit of background uh, to Professor Karsten, uh, he received his PhD from Saarland University in Germany in 2012, where he studied the effects of laser interference patterning um, on, on the microstructure and topography of metallic surfaces with a focus on tribological applications. Um, Professor uh, Gachot was, uh, was an acad academic visitor at the Tribology Group uh, at Imperial College in London and is currently the head of the Tribology Research Group at Vienna University of Technology. So, so in terms of, of agenda, um, we'll begin with a presentation uh, and then we'll switch for a few minutes to our sponsor, Anton Parr, uh, and then we'll come back to the presenter for your questions. Um, we're planning to go for around uh, 60 minutes in total today. However, depending on questions, this may slightly go over, so we do apologize if that does happen. Um, a reminder about our website, uh, surfaceventures.org. Please do visit it. Uh, it features videos from our previous talks and it has uh, information um, regarding uh, upcoming webinars and information about our Surface Ventures team. Um, so just before we start, um, we'd like to always learn a little bit about yourselves, um, our audience. So we have a quick poll. Um, like previous times, uh, a question should pop up on your screen uh, about right now, and it should ask, have you previously worked with, uh, with laser surface texturing? That's great. We've got a, a, a fairly decent split, half and half almost. Thank you for that. Um, so what I'll do now is I will hand over to our speaker, uh, Professor Carsten, over to yourself. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. From um, to have the opportunity to talk to you about laser surface texturing challenges and opportunities. Uh, first of all, I hope you're doing all fine, um, despite um, the given conditions right now. Uh, I would like to thank um, also, of course, Surface Ventures and Anton Palm for this great opportunity. And um, yeah, to start with maybe uh, a couple of numbers. Um, why do we talk about laser surface texturing today? So as an editor of a journal, I um, receive actually every week a lot of articles um, in the field of surface texturing. I just show you some examples here from the, from the previous years. I'm sorry that I do not have the updated um, year also um, included here, but as you can see until 2015, and I think the, the trend is still going, going on, you can see a rise uh, in number of publications related to laser surface texturing, especially in three related fields. We have uh, several articles in the field of tribology, that is also my um, field of competence. Um, then we have biointerfaces and mechanical properties. So over the years, we can see that um, there is a lot of interest um, in, in this society. Well, and uh, what is actually bringing us to the field that surface texturing is interesting? Um, it's inspired by nature. So if you look at surfaces in nature, you can find um, that most of the surfaces are not completely flat. 
Um, in fact, if you look at a beetle or a mosquito or honeycomb or even the butterfly wing, you can see that um, all those animals and plants, um, they have uh, specific uh, surface textures on top for different functionalities. Um, this can range from um, how the light is um, actually reflected or diffracted um, uh, up to um, better wetting conditions. Um, and many more what we can find. So, um, of course, nature has a certain kind of um, um, big advantage uh, related to the evolutionary times uh, where uh, nature developed these kind of patterns and, and textures on top of plant surfaces and, and animal surfaces. Um, but the engineer is trying to, to go in the right direction. Um, although lacking behind, um, I would like to show you some of the examples what we can do right now. Um, this is just a little a little summary of some, let's say, typical surface textures you can find in uh, material surfaces like metallic materials. Um, but it depends on the, on the process itself. You can even create that in uh, polymer surfaces, in ceramic materials and, and other materials as well. Um, so you can create like line-like patterns, um, which you can do by, by laser surface texturing. That will be also the focus of my talk today. Um, but you can also use coining, micro-coining. You can use uh, lithographic techniques and etching. So there are various ways how you can create um, textures on top of uh, surfaces. It's very interesting to see how, how that all develops further. So what about the applications? Um, we have plenty of applications actually in the field of surface texturing. I just would like to, to highlight some of them. Um, uh, some of the examples you see here, I will also come back in a minute um, to discuss a little bit more in detail what you can find. But just to give you a first overview, um, so it's about wetting, for example, I already said that before. Um, so contact angle between liquids on surfaces, is uh, a liquid drop more, let's say, spreading or does it have this more droplet shape? Um, it's about holographic patterning um, against um, plagiarism. Um, we have electrical connectors uh, down here where you can texture the surfaces in order to reduce um, uh, fretting. Um, and uh, it's all about also machine elements like bearings, um, gear parts and so on, but also in a very interesting field of uh, solar cells um, to increase the uh, light absorption. So as you can see, it's not all related to tribology. We have a couple of different applications um, available, and I would like to come back to some of them in a minute. First of all, um, I would like to mention that um, I worked in the past um, very heavily uh, with colleagues at Saarland University, where I also did my PhD. So. Thanks to my mentor, Professor Frank Mücklich from Saarbrücken, I had the chance to get in touch with this topic first. And uh, we were a group of people uh, at the Institute, uh, also Professor Lasagne, who is now a um, professor in Dresden, and also a leading scientist in the IWS in Fraunhofer Institute in Dresden. And these are some examples from, from his group, actually. Um, I would like to show you some of the very nice things, uh, what they can do in terms of the um, process. Um, one example is about dental implants. Um, so the idea is to have a better um, cell growth and improved cell growth and attachment uh, once you get um, a dental implant. Um, the process today is actually that you use um, three different um, methods, or you can use three different methods. It's like sandblasting, it's um, chemical etching um, and anodization, and you see there are different uh, problems uh, arising with contamination by sand or waste chemicals. Processing times are also, I mean, at the first look, it appears rather fast. But of course, if you think of a more mass production type, um, you can see that 1.4 minutes uh, maybe is a bit too long. So the idea is by the colleagues um, that they actually um, try to um, achieve that by uh, laser patterning of surfaces and, and what you can see here is that the threat of such a dental implant can be can be laser treated. Um, there is an improved cell growth. You can see that here in, uh, in some of the pictures below, on the left hand side and right hand side, that if you do that by the standard um, process like sandblasting and etching, there's a non-directionalized uh, cell growth, but when you do this um, on the right hand side with the laser, it's very directionalized, um, so the cell growth is uh, very much improved. You can also see that the 
this process, this laser process is pretty fast. It's 1,400 times faster and it's uh, a lot more, a lot cheaper than actually um, these uh, standard methods. So it's a good way to control um, cell adhesion on dental implants, for example. To go a little bit further, also from my colleague's group, um, a very nice example that you can also create uh, apart from um, dental implants. You can use this technique also for holography, for uh, let's say some um, plagiarism, anti-plagiarism tools where you can um, imprint uh, some logos and um, pictures and, and things. And how does that work? Um, just quickly, without going too much into the detail, so the colleagues in Dresden, they, they try to um, make that like in a printing process, we have different pixels. And you can see that depending on the pixel, uh, within this pixel, you can also change this, um, the periodicity of such a line creating. Um, and depending on the um, diffraction angle and the position where you look at, you can see different colors. And if you then all assemble that, you can also come up with, a, with this example like that is shown here on the right-hand side, um, the famous church in Dresden, the Dresdner Frauenkirche. Um, there's a very famous um, example. Coming to something maybe, yeah, uh, more relevant today, um, although this is about bacteria, not about a virus, um, but the group in Saarland University, my former university, under the guidance of Professor Mücklich, um, they have one specific focal point in antimicrobial surfaces. Um, we know already from the ancient times, from the Roman, uh, Roman times actually, that um, um, the Roman soldiers and, and people, they carried uh, water and, and things for, for their um, battles they had in, in copper cups and, and copper things, copper containments, um, because we know that copper and silver um, are fighting bacteria, so they can kill bacteria actually when they are getting in contact with the surface. Um, um, because we have a huge problem now in the, um, in the not only in the European Union, but you can see here from the statistics that nearly uh, 37,000 people die yearly in the EU, uh, EU because of this MRSA, so multi resistant bacteria. And um, a copper has one of the big uh, drawbacks that, of course, it, it starts oxidizing. And when you create, once you create these oxides on top of the surface, um, the efficiency is, of course, not the same in, in killing the bacteria. We can find a lot of places in hospitals, but also in public transport. Um, you can see that on the pictures um, here in the center below, um, where there is a risk of, of getting in contact with these bacteria. Um, when you do the surface texturing of such a surface, of course, you by this topographization, um, you can see from this um, uh, graph on the right hand side that the number of bacteria is um, significantly reduced. And it's not only about the release of copper ions, as uh, people thought in the beginning, um, because you can see here from this graph the number of bacteria on this axis um, over the time axis. So when you just have the release of copper ions, um, it's not really efficient. But if you have the contact really with the surface, so if the bacteria sticks to the surface and then you have to, of course, the release of copper ions, this is what we call contact killing. And then you can reduce the number of bacteria um, significantly in that case. So where are we now? I mean, we, we talk about surface texturing and there are different possibilities how you can do that. Um, you can see um, there are two parameters of interest. Uh, first is fabrication speed. So how fast can you actually fabricate, manufacture these textures? And the second important part is um, about the feature sizes. So is it possible um, to create on a broad spectrum of feature sizes in a relatively fast, with rather fast speed, those textures in different materials. You can see on the one hand side, there are um, technologies like scanning or micro milling or lithography um, methodologies where you can actually cover either small feature sizes or larger feature sizes. And if you do so, if you can create very small feature sizes, you very often have the drawback of um, small fabrication speeds. So the goal is, as you can see in this picture, to, to come up with a rather broad spectrum where you can cover, let's say, a big range of feature sizes, but also in, uh, with reasonable speeds. And that is the way we try to develop um, the, the methodology further. 
So one possibility is um, where we worked on um, in, in Germany before and, and still colleagues are very active in that field and we collaborate. Um, I'm looking now more on, on these things from a tribologist point of view and colleagues in Saarbrücken and Dresden, they of course are uh, still taking care for the development of the technique itself. Um, one of the techniques we used is um, called DLIP. It's direct laser interference patterning where you just use um, a laser beam that is split in several subbeams and then you just let them interfere at the surface of a material. And it is very similar to the things you did when you was a, a younger student or a, a pupil in school. So when you throw stones in water and you have your water waves and they start to interfere, you always have, of course, regions with, let's say, constructive interference and you have regions where you have destructive interference. And we use something similar here with the laser. When you do that, you can work on surfaces pretty fast. Um, you can even create, uh, I show a very nice example here of a Penrose tiling. Um, so not only line patterns or dimples are possible, but also you have the um, possibility to create more complex patterns in a reasonable time. And um, how does that basically work? So by the overlap of the laser beams, you have the possibility uh, either by changing the wavelength of the laser or the angle between the incoming beams. You see that here on the left-hand side um, that you can play around also between the spacing of such a line pattern, the creating, you can make that smaller, you can make that larger, uh, just depending on the angle theta here. Um, but sometimes it's a bit hard because people say, okay, I'm not interested in such kind of pattern. I would like to see something like what I show here in the left-hand corner below. Um, how can you do that? So now you have uh, different possibilities. You can either go to the lab and you can do that job uh, years long until you find the right way. Or, of course, what we call inverse problem. You just back translate that in... Um, it sounds a little bit complex, but it's actually not that complicated into reciprocal space by just an FFT, a fast Fourier transformation. And when you do that, um, you get actually the number of beams from that unit cell and you also get the um, arrangement, the configuration of the beams needed. And when you then go back to the laboratory and you start building up your setup, you will come to actually the desired pattern um, asked by industrial partners, for example. We have one big problem, um, and this is shown here on this slide. Um, it's also what um, actually it's coming from the colleagues from Dresden. Um, you see, if you do this with this uh, typical beam splitter configuration, um, for two interfering beams, the world is more or less okay. It's pretty straightforward, I would say. But if you want to create more complex patterns, um, let's say like the ones I showed before with the Penrose tiling, you would need a couple of um, optical elements here. And it's not a wonder, not a surprise um, that this guy is running wild here on the right hand side. So what we need to get is actually a compact design of an optical system that is able to create um, the patterns also uh, in a fast way that makes it attractive to the um, industry. And colleagues in Dresden, they did a, a, a big step forward. Um, actually, when I started with Andres Lasagne uh, many years before, and we were standing in the lab together, um, we were wondering how we could in the future create on, on curved surfaces or on larger areas um, those patterns. And when Andres actually um, uh, went to Dresden and um, further developed the technology, I was really impressed uh, what they can nowadays um, offer. And one of the things they provide, I think this is even not the up-to-date image um, because they really fastly develop the things. Um, this is one example where you can see how it is now actually in a very compact design uh, where you can also control the pattern what you want. Um, this is a nice example actually on a, on a curved surface, also a transparent material. So it doesn't matter if it is a metal or a ceramic or a polymer. Um, there are different ways to, to implement um, the surface textures on top. We talked so much uh, about now topography, but um, when I did my PhD, actually, I was very much in the details. I'm a material scientist from my background, so I was always interested in how those um, texturing techniques, apart from the topography, have an influence on the microstructure. 
I just would like to show you some of the examples uh, from my PhD work, actually. Um, it shows that when you do the laser treatment of a metallic surface, that you can play around even with grain sizes. And um, as material scientists or mechanical engineers, we know that uh, many mechanical properties, of course, heavily rely on um, crane sizes, um, crane size distributions, and so on. Just to remember whole patch relationship. Uh, so the smaller you get with the crane sizes, the stronger the material gets um, um, without losing ductility, actually. And this is very fascinating. And, and when you look a little bit further, um, this is a gold surface um, that has been sputter deposited um, on top of a silicon substrate. Um, when you irradiate that by laser and you see these uh, interference maxima positions where you put in most of the um, energy input, you can see how the grains grow. They grow also uh, alongside um, the thermal gradient, the temperature gradient, and then they meet here in the center line and they stop. A little bit, it reminds me of the solidification behavior of uh, cast iron. And then you have always these kind of coarse grain areas embedded in very fine grained areas. Um, and you can even make the distance smaller. And when you do that, you can see this image is just flipped by 90 degrees. You see that even this region in between is getting to crystallize in a very nice way. So you can play around with crane sizes. You can manipulate um, the micro uh, structure of material. And of course, this has an immediate impact on mechanical properties as well. Um, apart from crane sizes, uh, just to show you another interesting example, um, this is the formation of intermetallic phases in a titanium uh, aluminum multilayer system. So when we irradiate um, this stack, um, like it's like a bread where you have salami and cheese uh, frequently changing here. And when you do that by the laser, uh, what you can see is that in the region where the laser interaction was uh, most severe, those lamellar structures disappear. Um, you form uh, different phases in the material. And when you measure hardness um, in these laser irradiated zones, the hardness is higher by a factor of two compared to the lamellar surrounding area. And this, of course, is something you frequently repeat. So this is just a cross section of one part, but you have to see that there is again another part. And again, you have the lamellar structures. So it's a very nice composite example um, where you can have um, metallurgical effects. What about tribology in general? Um, when we look at the Strabeck curve, um, there are many conflicting reports. Um, so we know that surface texturing um, works pretty well under certain conditions in hydrodynamics. And we also know that we have a lot of papers resulting from mixed lubrication and boundary lubrication where you can have um, beneficial effects, but of course it depends on the tribal system. Just a few examples. Um, I call it dry or unlubricated conditions. So things that we know mainly from the literature over the past years. We also worked in that field. So when you have a sphere or an untextured ball and you're rubbing along um, a metallic surface um, that is textured, it also depends in this case if you have a line texture, if you rub alongside the grooves or if you do that perpendicular to the grooves. This black line here in the graph just shows the uh, reference surface that is untextured. And when you rub alongside or perpendicular to it, you can see how the friction coefficient drops down. Um, and this is the cycle number. It actually drops down significantly. And it also shows a very my, uh, nice dependency um, on the periodicity of your grating. So the smaller or wider you make the grating, it also has an impact, as you can see here on these three images, on the resulting friction coefficient. Um, you can nowadays also create patterns on top of this ball surface. I will show you an example at the very end of this talk. And um, there are many things possible even on curved surfaces um, by laser treatment. Another example, um, this is now referring to mixed lubrication where you have um, a lubricant on board. So what we did in our study was to create um, a kind of a grid lattice with different uh, periodicities. So periodicity means, again, if you think of this sinus curve, 
So the distance between um, the, the peaks of the sine curve. And, and when you do that and you measure the friction, we can see that for the black curve here, this is the untextured surface, the friction coefficient rises um, immediately after a short cycle number. If you do the grid structure, uh, you can see that depending on the periodicity again, if it is 9 micron or 6 micron, there is an extension by a factor of up to 130 with a very smooth friction coefficient in the begin until it starts to boost up again. So then we have starvation, then of course these uh, pockets are not existing maybe anymore because they are worn off and you see an increase in the friction coefficient um, with the, um, as a function of the friction cycles. But it's very impressive to see how much you can extend actually the, um, um, the, the, the cycle number until it starts to rise. One of my uh, students in my group, Ray, I think he's also uh, listening today, so greetings, Ray. Um, Ray is doing his PhD, actually he's coming to the end of his PhD, um, about tribal film formation in uh, microtextured bearings. This was a very nice um, collaborative work with the um, Aachen University, with the chair of uh, Professor Jacobs. Um, so uh, the colleagues there, they work in the field of uh, mainly in bearings um, and also wind power turbines. And the idea behind was to see the effect of um, textured micro bearing or micro textured bearings, so raceways of the bearings under um, additivated conditions. So we used the ZDP additivated oil um, and we wanted to see how much we can reduce the amount of sulfur and phosphorus um, as concentration in the oil um, and uh, how long it actually still creates this tribal film under contacting conditions. And um, to show you an example, we did this texturing of the bearing raceway and uh, different textures. So you see here in A, this is the um, pristine surface where we have some of uh, dimples implemented. You can still see the surface roughness, the surface finish. Um, and then we made a, a higher density of dimples, and then we had a grid structure and another one with a different periodicity. And what you see is on the right hand side, if you look at the uh, wear volume, um, that there can be a significant reduction in, in wear volume um, for, for such a texture. And um, the question is, why does that actually work um, that nicely? So when you look a little bit more in, in detail, um, especially by um, the points, uh, the topographic peak points, where you have a high curvature and a higher contact pressure. Um, these are the areas where you trigger um, the tribochemical reaction between the ZDP um, and the surface. Um, whereas in the valleys, uh, we measured that by Raman spectroscopy, whereas in the valleys you do not see this blue, typical blue coloration and um, the formation of a tribal film. So, it is possible actually to, like in a pressure induced case, uh, to form a, a protective film, a protective tribal layer, um, because by implementing a kind of artificial roughness, where you have a different contact pressure region, um, you trigger actually the formation of, of such a tribal chemical um, layer that is very interesting on the one hand side. And of course, on the other hand, um, you create pockets or grooves where you can um, deposit um, wear debris um, and, and thus, of course, reducing um, the abrasive um, component of the friction force. Some people asked me um, in the past about um, fatigue lifetime. We had in intensive uh, discussions with uh, company partners from SKF and Scheffler. And they ask, okay, if you do texturing of surfaces, um, I suppose you reduce the fatigue lifetime because you actually initiate uh, like um, crack initiation sites, um, or let's say locations where cracks can grow and um, can further develop. Um, we did some interesting tests with the colleagues from Aachen University. And what we found out actually is for, for this bearing setup that we used, you can see here on the right hand side, um, the, the blue curve is the standard surface, um, the Bible statistic here. You can see here, this is the, uh, the red curve is actually for the textured surface that we have um, an increase in the fatigue lifetime by a factor of three. So it must not be always detrimental if you create a surface texture in the metallic surface 
um, that it actually has a negative effect on, on fatigue properties. Um, of course, this cannot be generalized and it is highly system dependent. But just to give you a kind of a flavor um, that it is not basically a, a no-go uh, in terms of uh, fatigue reduction, a very nice example that we just recently published in journal Friction. Um, to sum up a little bit this, uh, this part uh, about the efficiency of uh, laser surface texturing uh, for different uh, lubrication regimes, uh, first of all, I would like to cite two spikes here. Um, very nice publication about mixed lubrication overview. Um, it highly depends on if you have conformal and non-conformal contacts. And as we know from literature, um, the Strybeck curve uh, differs for the different um, conformity conditions or contacting conditions. Um, there are a lot of conflicting reports actually um, from different groups in the world uh, saying that under non-conformal contact conditions, laser surface texturing does not have any positive effect. Um, we could not prove that. Um, actually, we did with Andreas Rosenkranz in Chile, one of my colleagues, a lot of studies in the field of non-conformal contacts. And also there we can see depending on the texture parameters, so texture area density, uh, feature sizes, um, is it more partial texturing or is it complete texturing? Um, this is also what Michel Fillon's group did extensively in the last couple of years. Um, you can get um, positive effects um, also under non-conformal contacting conditions. Um, but one of the major take home messages is, of course, there is no single or unique surface texture that is good for, for all the conditions. Pretty clear, as we have a, a bunch of uh, different tribology scenarios. And um, if you choose wisely your texture parameters, you can have uh, improvement, but it must not be. Um, and you must be very careful how you set up the textures in, in the surface. Now you can ask the question, okay, uh, Karsten, you showed uh, in the last couple of minutes uh, a lot of lab scale examples. What about uh, the highly loaded uh, situations? We did in the past also some, some tests with um, squeeze film dampers uh, for piston rings um, in turbines that are actually heavily loaded. And uh, just as a, a very nice example to show you how laser surface texturing can have a beneficial effect even there. You see the surface here. Um, you see that we um, selected a kind of a, a dot surface on, on, top of the, on top of the material for the piston rings. And you see in the right hand, on the right hand side in this graph, uh, a comparison, a very simple comparison between the, for the wear volume for a ground piston ring, so standard procedure, versus a laser textured piston ring. And it's very obvious um, that you have a, a big reduction in, in wear volume by a factor of six, actually, wear reduction uh, if you compare a ground piston ring with a laser textured piston ring. So even after, even in, let's say, higher loaded conditions um, or more severe conditions, you can find um, a positive effects uh, in terms of wear reduction. And if we move on, um, another interesting topic here um, is actually related to um, electrical connectors as um, electromobility is getting more and more prominent um, and of course combustion engines uh, will run out uh, in, the, in the next couple of years. Um, just to give you an overview, so up to now regarding electrical connectors, if you take such a car, um, we can have up to 2,300 electrical connectors in one car. And all these connectors, of course, are, let's say, um, a little bit suffering from uh, vibrations, oscillations uh, when operating the car in, in daily conditions. And uh, one of the ideas is um, to reduce actually the fretting amplitudes or fretting oscillations that may lead to wear and also to car breakdown. Um, as you can see from the statistics from the ADAC in Germany, um, big part of the car breakdown is related to the electrical system with 46%. And a big chunk of this 46% is related to electrical connectors. If you now think of also charging your car in the future uh, for the um, electromobility, so you have to always plug in, plug out um, the connector. And when doing so, um, of course, you have, um, you have wear. 
where may appear and the question is how can you um, actually reduce these, um, this kind of, of wear or how you can reduce the fretting tendency. So colleagues in, in Saarbrücken uh, and, and other colleagues, um, they work uh, also intensively in this field, um, how they can improve the connector situation and uh, reducing um, the, the risk of, of wearing off um, by using them. I showed you before an example for a ball on disk setup and uh, just to show you what you can do um, by ultra fast laser surface texturing. Um, in this case, it was done for EHD contacts. So we also textured uh, a steel sphere like a belt. You can see here a belt around the sphere and then you can have different configurations on different settings and you can measure um, in, in this setup, the EHD film thickness, and you can study the effects of surface texturing under EHD conditions. So this is a nice paper um, that has been um, done with colleagues from Imperial College in London, so Daniele Dini's group, and uh, also colleagues from Sao Paulo. Um, it was a very nice collaboration um, that we did, um, and just recently published also in Journal Friction. Um, if you are interested in more details, I would like to um, advise you or recommend you to to have a deeper look in this manuscript but just to show you that it doesn't need to be a flat surface always so you can study um, different effects of surface texturing even on on, on quite curved surfaces um, and you can do uh, interesting studies um, related to surface texturing coming to one of the last examples of today's talk um, what I would like to show you is something that um, pops up more and more in the scientific community. It's about the combination actually of uh, texturing techniques and coatings. Now you can ask, why is that happening? Uh, is surface texturing not good enough or are coatings not um, good enough? Well, we know that if you look at um, solid lubrication, uh, one of the big challenges in solid lubrication is the replenishment of a contact. So if you do that with oil or grease, um, it's pretty straightforward, um, of course, to lubricate a contact in most cases. Um, if you do that with uh, solid lubricants, once the solid lubricant is worn off, the story is gone. So the idea here is to combine um, texturing with coating deposition um, that both have a kind of a synergetic um, uh, approach. On the one hand side, uh, you provide the coating a kind of a reservoir on the other hand, you protect the surface texture against wearing off um, in this scenario. What we did here in our study was to, um, by electrophoretic deposition, uh, to make a coating of carbon nanotubes on top of a surface um, that has been textured. And um, interestingly, if you do that, if you combine that, you have a very nice replica of um, the, the textured surface with the uh, CNT um, coating on top. And if you look a little bit further on the uh, behavior in terms of uh, friction coefficient over cycle number, and just to explain you here what you can see. So this black curve is actually the reference surface. It is untextured. Um, you see typical behavior rise in the friction coefficient and then stabilizing. Okay, fine. If you do on the red curve, just the surface texturing, what you observe is that in the very begin, it starts to operate fine. Um, so you have a slight decrease in the friction force and friction coefficient, but then it starts rising and actually approaching the same curve as the reference surface. So you can think of that the surface texture has been worn off. And um, this is actually what we also see in our um, wear tracks. And when you see the, the green curve, this is just the surface with the CNT coating on top. So there is no uh, laser surface texture. Um, it starts fine. It's all fine until a sudden point, And then it starts rising immediately and also approaching um, the other um, curves. So this means that um, in this case, the lubricant, the carbon nanotube lubricant is, is getting away. And the blue curve is the combination of surface texturing and carbon nanotubes. And very surprising, but actually uh, what we hoped to see is that you have a 
rather low friction coefficient over a long cycle number and you do not see a rise. We also did the experiment much longer. I do not show that here, but you can believe me. Until it rises, it takes um, a large cycle number. And this is a very interesting proof that by a combination of surface texturing, where you provide lubricant pockets or reservoirs for the solid lubricant, and protecting the surface textures against uh, rubbing off um, by the CMT coating, it's an interesting synergetic approach. And this you can find now also for DLC coatings, combination of DLC and surface texturing. There are many articles coming from Chinese colleagues um, in the recent months where you can um, observe that people are actively working in that field. So to sum up and uh, to con conclude a little bit. Um, so first of all, uh, I think one of the take home messages is whatever you do, whatever kind of texturing technique you use, um, either you do that by micro coining or by photolithography or by laser surface texturing. First of all, what I see many times in, in, in different scientific manuscripts is that the geometry of what they call dimples or grooves is not always ideal. Um, so either it's looking like an ellipse, although it should be a circle, or um, people start patterning uh, entire surfaces, although partial texturing is better than uh, the entire surface. So whatever you do, first of all, you have to optimize your texturing technique in order to produce precise surface textures. So the geometry is the first um, prerequisite you need to, to focus on. So a large homogeneity, um, an easy integration in production lines, um, because whatever you do, if it is on the lab scale, fine. Um, industrial partners will ask you immediately, okay, how much time is needed? What are the costs? Um, uh, how can you do quality control, uh, quality management? Um, you have to have this um, production line integration process. It must be also supervised maybe by camera systems to see that whatever you do on, on different electrical connectors or uh, surfaces, it's more or less repeatable, reproducible, and that is a big, uh, big part. Another take home message I wanted to convey today is um, that surface texturing also for different methods what you use can also affect the materials microstructure. It's not always about the topography. So topography is one aspect, but when you use, for example, laser irradiation, it's a heat source. So you melt the material, it re-solidifies. You have changes in surface chemistry. You have changes in crane sizes. You may produce different intermetallic phases. Um, so there are many more factors that need to be considered and people should not only focus on topography effects. Um, regarding tribology, um, I would like to keep it as a question, how do textures actually work? There are still many conflicting reports. So people are not in all the lubrication regimes in Stryber curve, so to say, of one opinion, uh, what is the best way and, and how they actually work. And uh, this brings me to one point. What about guidelines, design guidelines for the future? So can we develop actually a kind of a design catalog um, where we are able to make a kind of a prediction, what kind of texture for what application or scenario might be the best. Um, brings me to the point of machine learning, big data, neural networks, because we have to deal with a lot of data. And the question is, how can you do that? Um, you need, of course, machine power, computer power, simulations also to, to develop these kind of um, design guidelines. So you see, it's still a lot to go ahead. Um, a lot of time is needed. A lot of intensive collaborations are needed. And I uh, invite you all um, to, to participate. I could see from the, from the poll, um, at least we got a pretty fair and balanced um, uh, feedback. So 40% said uh, yes, they have previously worked with laser surface texturing. So, and I hope the other ones who did not work in that field found it today um, interesting, exciting, inspiring for the future. And um, this can be a very still promising topic for the future not only related to tribology, but also to different scientific disciplines. In with this, I would like to thank you for listening and thanks again to Surface Benches and Anton Parr for giving this great opportunity. Um, I always uh, 
followed um, all the different and, and past uh, presentations and they were excellent. And I'm also looking forward to the next um, webinar, but this will be um, explained in a minute. Thank you for listening. And I'm of course ready for questions later on. Thank you, Professor Carsten, uh, really exciting talk. Um, so what we're going to do now in terms of agenda is we're going to quickly switch over to our sponsor, Anton Parr, and then we'll come back to Professor Carsten um, to take questions. So please do um, uh, give some questions in the chat box available uh, and we will hopefully pick them up. Nish, over to you. Great, um, thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, um, Carsten for a fantastic uh, presentation on surface laser texturing. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, the team at Surface Ventures for giving us the opportunity to uh, participate and uh, be part of this really excellent educational program that you know, has been developed uh, by the team at Surface Ventures. Um, so my name is uh, Nishal Malde. Um, I'm a uh, product manager at uh, Anton Parr. Um, I'm based in the UK and um, more or less kind of following on uh, Carsten's discussion. You know, when, you, when you're looking at <coughs> developing or um, designing, you know, modifying uh, surfaces, there's got to be a means and ways of actually how to measure those actual properties and you know what modifications are working, what modifications are not working. So I'm going to take some of your time, so I must thank you for your time, um, to tell you some of the solutions that we have at Anton Parr for characterizing material surface properties. Um, <clears throat> so first of all look um not many people or many people may not be aware of anton Parr. we've got a very rich history actually going back to 1922 so we're going to be a hundred year old company actually next year um <clears throat> working on um precision engineering and more so as we go into the you know um 2020 21st century 20 you know into the uh, 2021 uh, more into um materials characterization instrument techniques um, so we've got a large history behind us, um, we're forward thinking, we're always developing new solutions based on working and feedback from uh, our colleagues in academia and in, 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 from industry as well. Um, just to give you an idea, um, Anton Parr, actually that figure's probably changed now, we're probably about nearly 4,000 employees uh, globally. Um, the, 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 the key thing I want to you to actually take away is that actually we've got probably presence uh, around globally and probably within your locality as well. So you always got someone, Anton Parr, who is an expert in the field of uh, mechanical service testing or service testing that you can actually uh, uh, contact. Um, but one takeaway I do want to take, give you is that 20% of our revenue year on year we reinvest in our research and development into our products um, that actually meet um, the demands for research. So, you know, the qu question is, you know, what do we do? You know, it depends really on your applications. You know, we talked about surface modification, surface texturing. Uh, our kind of remit is quite broad. You know, we work with things like coatings, thin films, polymers, fibers, membranes, glass materials, it's its endless the type of material uh, compositions that we've worked in terms of projects. Um, and usually what, you, what I tend to find is that um, when you speak to individuals, they, they feel that their challenge is unique to them. But what tends to happen is when you talk to instrument manufacturers like Anton Parr, um, <clears throat> we've actually probably come across these type of uh, challenges in the past, speaking to other people, and we probably have a solution or a direction for a solution that can help you. Uh, so it's always worthwhile contacting us, even just to have a informal chat. Um, the question is, you know, what kind of properties are you looking to measure? I mean, here I've kind of listed some of the measurement properties that we can provide. Um, I know Carson touched on many of these things in, in terms of coefficient of friction, um, things of uh, 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 fracture, fatigue, um, coating adhesion, scratch resistance, uh, wear, um, those are the kind of uh, properties that we can consistently measure depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and typically speaking, when it comes to materials characterization, we've got a very broad range of techniques that are available. And in many cases, you know, we're very, very open 
to, um, if you're looking to find a technique, run some samples for evaluation, so you get an idea of what is out there in terms of capability. Um, and we do everything from mechanical service property testing to uh, nanostructure analysis, all the way up to things of like small angle X-ray scattering systems as well. So you're getting a a synchrotron system in on a lab scale. Um, well, look, that's kind of uh, enough uh, from me. Um, what uh, we've got next, um, which probably um, describes in a more succinct way is a short video presentation to give you an idea of what Anton Park can provide you. Um, I know there's, there'll be some sort of downloadable uh, information including some application case studies of work that we've done. Please help yourself and download those and uh, do reach out to us if we can help you. So um, I'll hand over um, back to uh, Thabit to, to run the um, video please. But um, thank you, Dan Tumpa. Um, so now we'll begin by taking some questions for Professor Carsten. So just bear with us, just waiting. Right, so um, well, the first questions we, we had were, um, are there any uh, metal surfaces without um, any coatings, which is uh, free of pores? Um, well, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly. Um, so what I showed before actually is um, that we can use different metal surfaces um, like titanium, aluminum, copper or steel surfaces to, to get them textured. We, we, of course, we always do a kind of a pre-characterization of the material. So what about the surface chemistry um, also related to maybe porosity or whatever. But actually, I mean, we do not create pores in the material. So uh, of course, it can be that due to the manufacturing process, what we irradiate by the laser, it has some porosity um, or it has some, some artifacts or, or defects inside. Um, but this usually does not influence the, the surface texturing process that much. I'm not sure if this answers the question correctly. Um, but um, yeah, you can also specify it a little bit more and then I will try to answer it in a better way. Brilliant. Um, when the laser meets the surface, is the material melted? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, it highly depends on the pulse duration of the laser system used. Um, so typically we um, differentiate between, let's say, fast lasers or let's say continuous lasers like a CO2 laser. Of course, there you bring a lot of thermal input into the material. Um, then we have the pulsed lasers. And when it comes to the pulsed lasers, we have, uh, let's say, two main categories. Um, the ones that are fast, like a nanosecond or a microsecond pulsed laser, where you have a deposition of energy, um, thermal energy into the material. So it can melt. It will melt. Definitely, it will resolidify. Uh, re and if you go, let's say, below 10 picoseconds, a little bit less than 10 picoseconds, you are starting the regime of the ultra-fast laser processing. 
Um, and in this regime, femtosecond, picosecond, um, actually the thermal uh, transport is completely different. Uh, we call it cold ablation um, because the, the thermal, um, let's say the, the thermal transfer is more or less blocked by the very fast um, photons coming to the surface. And with this, uh, you do not have a kind of a melting. It's more like an ablation process where you really um, immediately vaporize the material. It goes off um, if it once it reaches a threshold energy. Um, but this is completely different. So if you are in a nanosecond or microsecond regime, of course, you have melting of the surface and resolidification. But this is not true for systems in pico or femtosecond region. Great. Um, slide 28. How durable are these textures when triboform films do not form or are not durable enough? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it is very beneficial if you can create a, a protective tribal layer on top. This is true. Um, but we have a lot of examples also studied in the past where we have not used any kind of lubricant. So the surface can be durable. Um, I remember myself that we had also four conveyor systems in steel industry. Um, we once textured uh, roller bearings and, and things like that. And even after, I think, three or four months um, in industry under operation, when it was disassembled, um, we could see that te the texture is still visible. So the texture must not be necessarily be destroyed or, or wearing off, um, even though there might not be SADDP or other additives present, um, saving or helping with the story. But of course, it is beneficial if you can have this combination of a tribal film or you have a coating on top um, that prevents um, the surface texture to get rubbed off. Yeah. Great. And the next question is, could it be that conflicting research papers are also the consequence of conflicting or differing test instruments slash conditions? Great question. Yeah, this is a big debate in tribology anyway. I think not only in tribology, but as a tribologist, I must tell you, um, I know, I think there was a, a very nice paper uh, one year ago uh, from a colleague in Sheffield um, where they studied um, actually repeatability, reproduci reproducibility of tribometer tests. And they found out that, of course, in papers, some people, they may do like two repetitions or not even a single repetition. Um, they use completely different machines, um, different setups, um, and as it is all the tribal system, um, of course, relying on um, your, your setup, um, it's hard sometimes to compare A with B, yeah? because the machines are completely and, and the transfer, of course, of knowledge from one tribometer to another tribometer is not always straightforward. It cannot be. Yeah? So when you do the comparison, you have to do the comparison in, in a very fair way. So you have to really look at the details, the data, the machines used, uh, what contact condition, is that ball on disc, is it pin on disc, is it ring on ring, is it block on ring. So there are many, many different things and of course you cannot compare A to B, but if you do that fairly, you can still see some kind of conflicting research papers um, despite, let's say, more or less similar contact or experimental conditions. Yeah. But it's a great point. It's a great debate. And uh, we all have to see that yeah. reproducibility in the tribometer testing is one of the major goals or one of the main priorities anyway. Yeah, yeah that was a definitely an interesting question. The next question, um, could the fatigue life uh, improvement from laser texturing come from introducing compressive uh, residual stresses into the metal surface? That's a pretty good question. Um, we did in the past some um, X-ray diffraction uh, measurements for, for the stress situation. And when you compare the, the laser textured surface with the untextured surface, you can see that laser surface texturing indeed um, induces uh, a small amount of compressive stresses. But it is not that significant that I would say like in, um, uh, let's say, uh, when you do shock peening, uh, where you have uh, large amplitudes and where you can have uh, a deep zone of compressive stresses in the material. I mean, there's also laser shot peening um, that is used um, by the plasma wave to create compressive stresses um, up to millimeter range. 
Um, in our case, when we do the laser surface texturing, um, the, this zone of compressive stresses is not that deep, and this is also not that high from the amplitude. But there might be a little effect um, as well from the from the small compressive stresses. It's hard to measure um, because you have this textured area. And it's, it's not that it's not that easy from the X-ray diffraction point of view um, to measure properly um, the residual stresses. Uh, what is the minimum and maximum thickness um, that DLIP uh, can be done on steel surfaces? Uh, well, as it is not a kind of a deposition technique, I would not talk about a minimum or maximum thickness. I think the colleague um, was guiding in a direction, so what could be the texture depth? And the texture depth in that case for the system, what we used in Saarbrücken in Germany um, was about some nanometers, depending on the energy density of the laser, um, up to, let's say, one or two micron depth. If you do this direct laser interference patterning, if you would use just a, let's say, a femtosecond laser and you would uh, drill dimples inside, you can even go 30, 40 micron deep. This is not a big issue. But if you do this D-lip, and DLIP, because of the, let's say, thermal transport, it is in fact limited to metallic surfaces up to 2 micron, 3 micron at the very end. But I would more say 1.5, 2 micron deep, up to, let's say, a few nanometers if you wish. If you just do a gentle treatment of the surface by a small laser energy density. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, a general question. A lot of people predict the death of the uh, internal combustion engines in a few years because of the placement by electric motors. But what about emerging hydrogen fuel fueled engines? Uh, would there be enough uh, lithium in the world to replace all billion, billions or IC uh, cars by electric? Well, a very good question, but I'm not a car specialist, automotive specialist. Um, I would give, um, let's say, from the engineering point of view, my personal opinion on that. Um, first of all, it's true. I mean, we need for the um, battery technology some elements that are rather rare. Um, and it's pretty clear that uh, we are running out of some of the resources. Um, this is also true, by the way, for titanium. So if you look at titanium, titanium will not last another 200 years. So it will be over, if I have the numbers correct in my head, um, please correct me if I'm wrong from the community side. Um, I think it's another maybe 50 to 100 years where you can have still enough titanium available. Let's say 100 years. But we are limited, of course, in these elements. Um, and about the depth of the uh, internal combustion engine, uh, when you talk to car manufacturers, um, they still say, okay, we will not stop, of course, the production next year. Um, we still have to build up a reasonable infrastructure for electromobility. Um, and of course, it cannot be that uh, when I want to travel to some, some vacations that I have to uh, stop by um, every here and then and waiting hours long to charge my car. So until this situation is still in that way, Basically, the idea is nice, but without the proper infrastructure, we still have to deal with the in internal combustion engines quite a while, I would say. But that's my personal opinion, yeah. Agreed. Our next question, um, what is the maximum temperature uh, the DLIP uh, can withstand? Um, also, not sure if I understood it correctly. Um, first of all, if you do the DLIP on a surface, um, the, the temperature that can be reached within a few nanoseconds can be quite high. can be so high that you can even melt refractory metals like tungsten or molybdenum or tantalum. Um, so temperatures can rise within 100 nanoseconds up to, let's say, 3,500 Celsius. Um, if you, of course, have already a textured surface and you want to apply this surface in a, let's say, the steel industry where you have higher surrounding temperatures, um, well, it just depends on the base material. Um, I wouldn't say there is a strong impact uh, by texturing on the, on the temperature resistance of the material. But it's true that when you do the texturing, um, you can melt even, as I said, tungsten. And that is um, extremely high melting <laughs> with 3,500 Celsius. Yeah. 
great. And our next question, in case of electro contacts in cars, are these um, lubricated additionally to structuring? Um, no, usually what you have is uh, for the electrical connectors or also for the charging plugs, um, they are not lubricated. Um, so this is the problem. And if you drive your car over a bumpy road, you can imagine that due to the oscillations, vibrations, uh, all these connectors, they may vibrate um, with micro oscillations. And that is what we call fretting. So if we have very small amplitudes or oscillations in the micrometer and even lower than that range, then we have fretting. And fretting can lead to fretting wear and can lead, of course, to failure of the electrical systems or the, or the connectors. And this is what we try to avoid in the future that we have uh, a reduction in this fretting amplitude or um, by that, by doing that, reducing the wear of the, uh, um, of the plugs. Brilliant. Um, we'll take a few more questions. Um, I know we're uh, past 10 o'clock, so we'll take the next two questions after this one, another question, and then um, we'll pro provide the questions uh, to Professor Carsten, who who should hopefully be able to provide okay. responses and we can get them back to you. Um, so this question is, uh, is there limitations for polymer substrate texturing using uh, DLI? So the main limitation always comes from the fact, um, is your material absorbing the laser light? Um, if it is absorbing the laser light properly without having too many reflections, it's basically doable. Um, some of the polymers that are especially transparent um, and when you work with, a, let's say, a solid state laser like a neodymium yak laser um, that is emitting mainly at 1064 nanometers infrared light, uh, some of the materials are transparent for the laser light. So it just goes through. Um, you do not create any textures. But for, for, for this, uh, also for transparent materials, you can use different laser sources like a titanium sapphire laser or you can simply change the wavelength of the of the of the laser source and, and then you are able to texture the surface for polymers as it is photoablation taking place it just needed or it just needs a kind of a threshold energy density that must be overcome that you can create a texture on the polymer once you reach that threshold it's doable and of course depending that the absorption is given by uh, by the material itself you know? Brilliant. And we'll take one final question. Um, does the research community know if laser texturing has been adopted in the field, for example, within auto, automotive OEMs, or even if they are looking into this technology? Yes, uh, there are um, intensive collaborations actually going on. I cannot say too much about that. Um, you know, this is uh, mainly by NDAs. Um, so I will not say any names, but um, yes, there is interest in the community. Um, and, and as I said before, despite uh, the matter of fact that electromobility is, is moving forward uh, quite fast, uh, still for the classical combustion engine, there are, of course, um, solutions by, by surface texturing to improve um, still the situation and um, to reduce frictional losses by some percentages. Um, so, yeah, quick answer. Yes, there is. And um, we, for example, have um, collaboration projects in that field. Brilliant. And um, that's the final question. Uh, we will pass on your questions. I know there are a fair few questions which have not been answered. We'll hopefully pass them on to Professor Carsten and we'll um, make every effort to get them back to the answers back to yourselves. So, on that note, um, I want to thank everyone for the questions. I especially want to thank um, Professor Carsten for this really engaging talk. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, I want to uh, pass a reminder that uh, please do visit our website where um, this, this uh, webinar and our previous past webinars are available and further information on our next talks will be available too. Our next webinar uh, is organized for the 27th of May um, by Professor Albano. Um, so stay tuned uh, for the registration details. Um, we'd also like to take a, a minute to ask for your support to take the time to advertise these lectures to your contacts. Um, it'd, it'd be a great help to us. Um, we'd like to also thank um, Anton Parr um, and the Institute of uh, Engineering and Technology 
for supporting this uh, webinar. And we'd also like to um, uh, inv invite you to join um, the Institute of Engineering and Technology's uh, webinar, which is Challenges in Tribology. There is a link on the slide um, which is showing and um, the uh, details uh, for, the, for the webinar on the 26th of May. Um, also, we'd like to um, invite you to um, our, an exciting prospect of uh, Surface Ventures, which is our first online workshop, uh, which is on nano, um, nano impact. Um, and that's on the 13th of May at 9 a.m. 9 there's some details there, and there'll be further details on our website. So please do um, join us and have a look on our website for further details. Uh, it's essentially an introduction to surface engineering workshop uh, with a nano impact uh, demo. Um, and that will be led by um, one of our team members, uh, Dr. Sam uh, McMaster. So on that note, I sort of thank everyone for joining us. Again, thank you very much, Professor Carsten. Um, on that note, so we, hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.